It's the final race of the weekend for Gridlife Touring Cup from Circuit of the Americas. Welcome back to the Super Lap Battle event and the first round of Gridlife Touring Cup for 2023. I'm Kyle Heyer, joined by Alex Moss. Alex, we've had three races, a qualifying and a practice so far. It's been a wild weekend, but we're going to invert 11 of our finishers from race three and start them like that for race number four. So that means that Michael Hilo in the 224 Nissan 350Z, he will start this race in first. Yeah, that invert is really going to shake things up and make things exciting, I think. Um, as we were talking about before the race here, it's really anybody's race from that, that top half of the grid, really. Yeah, again, 11 car invert. That means that Jeremy Swenson, who has swept the weekend thus far, is going to roll off in row number six alongside Tom O'Gorman, who's jumped in the 212 Team ASM car. So he'll be in the show. He's our 2022 champion, and he's back in the car. So he could be threatening as well in that black and blue uh, ASM and Hawk Performance uh, S2000 as they head up over the crest here. Uh, Alex, this is our final race of the weekend, 12 to 15 minutes with that invert. The first lap of this race is going to be as chaotic as all the laps we've seen previous, and they have been, the, the bar for that is really, really high. Yep, uh, a lot of potential there for that. And um, as you were mentioning, uh, Jeremy and, and Tom side by side, they're our two most recent champions. Um, so they're not going to be giving each other an inch more than they need to to have a clean race here, and it should be exciting. All three of our previous Gridlife Touring Cup champions are in this field. All of them are between ninth and 12th position. So this is going to be an interesting show to, to kick things off for our final race of the weekend for GLTC. Starting lineup is as follows. On row number one, it's Michael Hilo in the 224. Gary Wimble in the number one Corvette, two is outside. Pole sitter on the weekend was Luke McGrew. He starts third alongside the 71 Myriad Motorsports car of Joel Morrison. Matt Walbaum, a local Texan now, he starts fifth in the number 90. Ronnie Vidoc starts sixth in the number 99. Lawson Crane and Austin Hurdle will share row number four with Erica Till and James Houghton in their front wheel drive Hondas. They will start ninth and 10th. Jeremy Swenson and Tom O'Gorman will start in row number six with ASM teammate Zach Lavoie behind and Lena Chin on the outside of that seventh row. Eric Jensen and Jackson Jensen, father and son, start in row number eight. Mike McGinnis and Julio Crispin start 17th and 18th. Rookie to the series, Corey Mitchell starts 19th in this one alongside Hans Horpital from Myriad Motorsports in the 77. Adam Ulrich starts 21st alongside Brian Tyson in the number 23. And Wes Case in the 767 starts 23rd alongside Adam Wood in the 207. Andy Funston starts 25th in the 163 alongside Paul Curley, who I hope is repaired, and it looks like he is. Uh, he starts 27th. It was a differential that blew up in the first race. We'll get more, or the last race. We'll get more on that for you in a moment. He'll start alongside Carl Hurdle. Then it's Tony Marchev, Matan Rosenberg, who is also repaired. That's a power steering line for him. And Tyler Starr, wrap up the rest of your field. I documented the 45's issues. There was another part of that that we didn't get to see. When the 45 came up over the crest and had his differential go, Eric Cattill was following so closely that he actually drove up underneath the rear bumper of the 45 and had some fairly significant damage to the front of that hybrid racing EG. The hybrid racing team and Eric put in a ton of work to get it back pretty. Well, it's missing a headlight now. It's certainly going to be a one-eyed wonder, but it is back repaired and ready to race for race four. Yeah, real shame about that car. It's one of the best looking cars on the field, I think. Um, but it's good to see them racing and, and really not much anyone could have done about it. They, they were racing for position and the car in front just lost drive and, and not something you typically anticipate. And a similar story for West Case. We saw that car turned around sideways. No contact to start that. The bodywork we saw was from Mike McGinnis just skirting by the spinning West Case. Just knocked some plastic off. Everybody's uh, fine and dandy with how that happened. And West will be missing a portion of the bumper, but no big deal for this fourth and final race. Race. We're packed up and stacked up 15 rows deep as we have been all weekend. And we have had a shocking and good lack of attrition. I hope I'm not jinxing anybody here, Alex. But we started the weekend with 32 cars. We've only lost one. That's the 101 of Haley Myers, who had so much fun in her first two races. Unfortunately, a clutch issue. Oh, is she back out? No, that's the triple eight. Uh, a clutch issue for her. Uh, she will not make the race four grid. Yeah, I, I was actually just talking to her before the start of the race here. And, and uh, she did have a ton of fun. Turns out she was born right by me um, in England. Um, she has a great time running with us and is looking forward to, to figuring out what to do next. I hope it's more Grid Life Touring Cup. We've got one more for you here this weekend. 
Fort Gridlife Touring Cup Series action. We have seven more rounds of this, six of which we are going to have live streamed. We're hoping to get that uh, seventh and final one at Road America live streamed as well. Companion Series race with NASCAR on July 27th to 29th. For the first time, Michael Hilo will start on the front row alongside Gary Wimble. Here they come up the front straight away. The timer is about to start ticking. We're about to go racing here from Austin, Texas and Circuit of the Americas one final time from Coda. Slow start here. Gary Wimble noses ahead just a little bit, but the green flag waves and we are racing. Everybody scatters. Two and three ride. Ronnie Vidoc, a great run to the inside of Morrison. Crispin's going to take Jackson Jensen. Four across with two ASM cars on the outside. Lena Chin and Zach Lavoy into turn one. It's a pinch point here. A little bit of a lock up there from I think that was Lena Chin or West Case, but through turn one so far so good. And down the hill we go. Alex, there were a huge discussion from race three. Track limits. It's an instant DQ if you run wide today in this race because so many drivers did it in the previous race. They were told specifically what not to do, and the rules have changed for this one. They are no, no longer giving you benefit of the doubt. You have to stay on the bounds of the racetrack because we've got a good battle here. Morrison's dragging a bumper through turn four now, it looks like. Yeah, and it's important for us to stay on the track and, and race within the bounds of, of the surface that we're given here, just like any other sport, really. It's no different to football or tennis or anything else. You've got to keep it in play. They painted white lines on the track for a reason. All the drivers were told what the lines were. There's one car wide. The difference here is you have to gain an advantage for that to be a disqualification. If you run wide to avoid contact or because you've lost control for a moment and didn't gain, that's totally fine. Wimble leads into turn number 11. Hilo follows and Vidoc to third. Great run there as Curly tries to charge back as Adam Ulrich in the background, the blue on gold Corvette into turn number 11. Yeah, really great to see all those cars that, that we've seen have issues all be back on track with us. All those Corvettes are uh, back there um, and charging forward from the back of the pack. Eric Attil side by side with Wallbaum. Look at Joel Morrison in the J Swap uh, S2000 up the outside of Lawson Crane. His first weekend, and he has gotten the baptism of a lifetime here in GLTC, racing inside the top 10 all weekend long. Keeps Morrison's position away from him there as Luke McGrew. We thought he would be the one to beat in this race. All his rewards weight is gone. He's been the fastest car on track in most of the sessions, but he rides fourth right now behind Vidoc. Yep, and fairly new build for him, so possibly still getting used to the car, getting used to the setup and all that kind of stuff still. Um, but Luke's an incredible driver. That car is going to be a real big force to be reckoned with for the rest of the season, I think. James Houghton side by side with O'Gorman in the background here as McGrew pushes the issue now on, I think that was, uh, that was, was that Vidoc that he had just gotten by here? Yes, it is. Vidoc, he's trying to put pressure on, goes to the outside at turn number 19. This is a very tight corner. This is one of those track limits trouble spots. Everyone stays in bounds there, and McGrew completes the pass very cleanly on the outside. Lawson Crane wants to pass, but can't get it done. Morrison, dragging the rear bumper, closes in in fifth place. Yeah, great pass there. That turn 19 is a tricky turn. It's a little off camber, and it can send you way off to the outside, way more than you think it could. Lawson Crane now trying to get by the 99 who's slipping spots. Joel Morrison is right behind as well. But where do you go? You're boxed in here. Oh, spin and a slide. Tony Marchev gathers it up. He'll keep straight. Into turn one. Crane on the inside. Bounces over the curbs. Vidoc might lose another one here unless he can throttle down the hill a little bit more effectively. Look at Waldbaum back to the inside of Cattil and the whole rear clip of that number 71 has fallen off right over Cattil's car. We'll carry on. That might be a debris flag for now, but uh, no longer is the drag flapping around on that number 71. Yeah, hopefully that doesn't cause any impact. Those uh, are not really dangerous, I don't think, for, to have those bumpers out there, but hopefully it gets to a safe spot for us. McGrew pressuring Hilo for second. If he gets by that 224, Gary Wimble better watch out. McGrew beat him in the final lap in race number three. Couple ASM on ASM battles here. O'Gorman towards Matt Waldbaum, and just ahead, Cattil keeps pressure on Morrison. Slide by Hilo, loses a spot to McGrew, and Lawson Crane in the mix now to the outside through turn number 10. Yeah, it looks like uh, Luke's on a charge here. He's up to second already and, and coming for the first place, I think. Cattil, big dive on the 71 into turn 11. He's got overlap. He's got position now. Great clean pass in the braking zone for a car that also doesn't have ABS. That was an impressive pass there for Cattil. Look at O'Gorman now side by side with Wallbump. Slides in ahead of Austin Hurdle, who's going to go to the inside here. Maybe take them three across down the backstretch. Cattil defending from Morrison. Vidoc defending from Cattil. Look at this down the backstretch. Battles everywhere, Alex. Yeah, up and down the field we're seeing battles. This is exciting right now. Into the braking zone, Hurdle on the inside. Look at O'Gorman leaning on the brakes into turn number 11. Well done there. Hurdle leaves space. So does O'Gorman. They get through turn 12 quite nicely. Good Cattil now up to Hilo. He's going to go to the inside at 13. 
And he's going to have overlap and complete this pass as well. So move Eric Cotill up another spot. That should put him inside the top five in this race, which would be a, a really solid run as we've got a full course caution now. And it is for, I think that's Matan Rosenberg in the 484 car, if I saw that correctly. So full course yellow, the field is frozen. And now this is always one of those moments where you have to make sure you're not passing another competitor. It's very easy to miss a flag, and that is an instant DQ in Grid Life Touring Cup. So you do not want to have a position gained under caution. So hopefully that's a quick recovery. That car is uh, stalled, but we should be able to drag it off track pretty quick and at least get a couple more laps of racing. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, it looked like it was an easy spot to recover as long as it's not leaked uh, any fluid or anything like that. I imagine that we should be able to get going again. Yeah, so again, that was Matan Rosenberg who had a power steering issue in race number three. You saw the smoke in the previous race. It ended up just being a freight power steering line as... Looks like Hans is slowing down as well here. Yeah, I wonder if he's given... Well, I don't know if he's given spots back or if he's... I'm not sure what's going on, if he's got a problem, but we'll find out in a moment as it is the 484 of Matan Rosenberg. And in race three, he was able to get off tracks in a safe spot, and this one didn't get very far. And you have to wonder if that's a different problem, because if it was just, if he knew that it was power steering, he probably would have continued to drive it into a safe place again. I wonder if this is transmission or drivetrain related in general. Uh, it's possible. It's also possible he's just being smart. I mean, if, if we've got a power steering failure somewhere and we don't want to be leaking power steering oil onto the track, so he may be just be being smart, smart and making sure that he's not dropping fluid onto the track, um, or it may be something more terminal. Well, we hope it's not the latter, as the pace car driven by Charlie Enslin uh, is he's pulling double duty this weekend, scrutineering and driving the pace car. As the field slows up, this is going to give us a chance for a restart. And Gary Wimble probably looked up and saw those yellow flags and went, oh, man, he had such a big lead. And now Luke McGrew will start right behind him on the restart. Yeah, it's the unfortunate part of these full course yellows is all the, the hard work you've done to build a lead is erased immediately. Uh, makes it more exciting for us, but but it's a shame for the leader. You can see the safety workers pointing there at what seems to be a trail of fluid out of the 484. So it seems like Matan just didn't want to oil down the track, which was very, very smart. You'd rather have the yellow than have oil on the racing line and have a real bad outcome because of that. So we're under caution, under full course yellow for the second time this weekend. And we'll pace around here about 45 miles an hour. And hopefully we can clear this up pretty quick and we can get back to racing. Yep. Yeah. Hopefully that fluid trail isn't too long and they can get that cleaned up quickly. The car looks like it'd be easy to, to drag away, um, assuming it's not dropping more fluid as they pull it away too. So resetting things for you. Again, we inverted 11 drivers from our race three finishing order. Eric Cotill's up five spots from ninth to fourth. A really good start for him, uh, despite having to kind of dispatch the rear bumper of Joel Morrison's car as it sailed through the air in the S's. He's up inside the top five. And Lawson Crane sitting in a podium position here. If he could finish this out, this would be a phenomenal start to his Grid Life Touring Cup career. Michael Hilo dropped back to fifth, but he's still holding on very, very well. Uh, for a driver that has never started on the front row before. And we're going to have to get a flatbed for this one so that we don't drag it around the track with that oil leaking. So we're under caution again for Grid Life Touring Cup race number four. Our races are generally between 12 and 15 minutes. And just to keep an eye on how things are progressing, eight minutes have elapsed. It takes about five minutes to do a pace lap here, Alex. So you have to hope that as soon as they get this thing on the rollback, we might get one, we might get two laps, but it's not going to be a lot. And Gary Wimble has to know that and has to be ready to jump. If we do get back green, he'll have to be on it because he's not going to have a lot of time to defend. That's right. He's not going to have a lot of time uh, to defend from Luke. And, and likewise, you know, the people behind Luke, um, Eric Cotill in fourth, he'd be within striking distance of a restart as well. Um, and, and definitely has the um, pace and aggression to make it happen. And Lawson Crane, could he be a factor in this as well? All assuming we get back to green flag racing, which we certainly hope we can. I think Gary Wimble's probably one of two minds right now. Either he wants to go back green and hold off Luke McGrew, or he'd rather just have it stay yellow and pick up his first Grid Life Touring Cup win. You never really want to have him under yellow, Alex, but you take him however you can get him. Yeah, I've got to imagine that his his first prize right now will be to, to have this go green and defend well and, and keep the win. Uh, second prize for him will be to finish this under yellow, I'd expect, um, and still keep the win. Nobody wants to finish second. 
Um, and as you say, you'll take them how you get them. Yeah, Luke McGrew, we mentioned yesterday, well, it's been 854 days since he has held a first place trophy in Grid Life Touring Cup. You know that it's on his mind that his teammates right ahead of him, Alex, but when the green flag goes, if it goes, there's no teammates anymore. He's going to be going for this. And we've seen Luke race so respectfully all week long. We know that's just how he races, but we know the aggression's going to come out a little bit just because that victory is so, so close. Yeah, he'll do everything he can to get by uh, uh, Wimble, but, you know, he'll do it fairly. I, I've got no doubts that, that Luke's not going to do anything that he shouldn't do to try and get the win, but he will do everything he should do to get it, too. All right, so good news. Here's what I can tell you. We're past the start finish line and no white flag displayed alongside the yellow so we'll get at least two more laps which means that at least one of those could be green we'll have to wait and watch the lights on the safety car when they extinguish that means we're coming back green and we do single file restarts in grid life touring cup uh, so keep that in mind as we roll through and uh, around to complete another lap three and a half miles around here is plenty of time so hoping that car can get up on the rollback and once it's on there alex assuming that trail isn't on the track they should just be able to drive that truck right off and we can get back to racing Yep, once it's on the truck, it's going to be fine. I think the, the X factor here is how much oil got dropped onto the track and how much they have to clean up. Clean up oil just takes time, unfortunately, and, and you can't have it on the track. Right, and so there'll be, uh, oh, there it is on the rollback driving away, and you can see, you can actually see the line in the verge there, that red painted area. If he did a good enough, if he sensed it coming and got into the verge, then they'll just leave that. It'll be fine. Yeah, it didn't look like there was any real concern about the fluid on the track, so, so my guess is it's just a case of getting these trucks clear of the track, and, and we should be good then. Yeah, so now the question mark will be, we will likely restart this time by. The question is one or two laps. I would guess one, but we'll know right as the green flag flies. If that white comes with it, it'll be a one-lap shootout here at Circuit of the Americas with 31 cars. Uh, so we'll have to keep our eyes very closely on the start stand as the field rolls back around. So Gary Wimble leads the way. Luke McGrew in second. That's Corvette, Corvette. Then Lawson Crane's BMW M3, followed by Michael Hilo in a Nissan 350Z, Eric Attil in a Honda Civic, Ronnie Vidoc in an Acura Integra, then Joel Morrison in an S2000, and two more S2000s behind that, one Tom O'Gorman, one Matt Waldbaum, and then a Nissan 370Z in 10th place with Austin Hurdle. There is a V6, a V8, and four cylinders all represented in the top 10, all from different makes, models, and manufacturers. And this is a new year and some rules additions and changes, Alex, and I have to say, I'm feeling very confident about how the season is going to go. The parity seems to be pretty good. This is a track we knew was gonna benefit the Corvettes, but everyone else is so, so close. Yeah, I don't think there's anything to be um, terribly afraid of from, from this race, uh, or from this weekend, I should say. Um, I, d I don't think you'll ever learn that the parity is good, but you could see if potentially it was really bad, and I don't think we've seen that so far. So, so I think that's a good thing, and I think that bodes well for the rest of the season for us. I think so, too, and again, our next event is at the end of March at Carolina Motorsports Park, which is a new track for us. And it'll be an interesting uh, interesting race because it's a little bit different in terms of how the track is constructed, a little bit, a lot more narrow and certainly a lot shorter as well. So it'll be a very different style of car that would have the advantage there. But again, power to weight series. Everyone's got uh, something that their car has over their next competitor, but everyone has something that's worse than their next competitor too. There's really no two cars that are perfectly equal everywhere, maybe save for the ASM camp, where they build those cars pretty much spec and they are solid, solid race cars. Uh, certainly they have a formula um, that they follow, but no two cars are alike. Um, I would say every car gets a built a little bit better than the last. Um, as an old boss used to tell me, if you, didn't, if you wouldn't do anything different next time, then you really didn't learn anything. Um, and I think anybody who knows Andy knows that he's out to learn all the time and as much as he can. I think that's a, a great way to look at it. And Lena Chin is driving the newest ASM built S2000 right now. Uh, down the order just a little bit, looks like P20 at the moment. But her first weekend in this car, getting used to rear -wheel, uh, the rear-wheel drive platform that she's in this season. Uh, and this is a track that, uh, that will take some tuning and figuring out. I think they were fighting some issues early in the weekend. But I think CMP, uh, that car will be wrapped and liveried and ready to roll for the rest of the season as uh, we creep towards the restart here. Yeah, it looks like the starter has the white flag in his hand, so I suspect we're just going to get one lap of racing here at the end. Three and a half miles in our final race, 20 corners. Luke McGrew resides right behind Gary Wimble. Two Corvettes lead the way. This will be a one-lap shootout to decide it all here in Grid Life Touring Cup. Jeremy Swenson, by the way, down in 11th place. Remember, he won the first three races. As far as the weekend championship goes, he feels pretty safe up there, but there's still lots of shifting and shuffling inside the top 10 to, to deal with here in this final 20 minutes or 20 
uh, corners of racing. Yeah, I'm sure uh, as smart as Jeremy is, uh, he's not looking at the or thinking about the weekend championship right now. He's thinking about Austin Hurtle, Matt Walburn, and Tom ahead of him uh, and seeing how far up the, the order he can make it in this lap. He's got 10 cars in his windshield trying to put them in the mirror. We come past. They start saying no white flag that time, so we might get two laps. Here we come. And green flag is back in the air. We're racing once more and no white flag. So we will get at least two laps of racing in GLTC up towards turn number one. Look at Cattill on the 224. Sweeps to the left. Ronnie Vidoc follows him through. Hurdles middle three wide there in the pack with Hans Horpital to the inside. Julio Crispin on the outside. Turn one on the restart. A pinch point here. Oh, Gorman gets pushed wide there by Joel Morrison. Fair play here as we head down the hill towards the S's. Yeah, nice clean restart. It uh, looks like everybody uh, is getting through cleanly, which is what we want to see. Uh, and then we can get to racing with, with two laps left. Well, Gorman wanted to go to the inside of Joel Morrison there. He pushed him offline, didn't push him, but had Morrison kind of shift his line a little bit because Morrison saw Tomo thinking about it here as he looks at turn number six, seven, and eight as a potential passing opportunity around the outside there. What a move there by O'Gorman. That's something that we've seen many times again. And up the inside of Vidoc, that's not going to work, though. Has to tuck in back behind the 99. Yeah, it looks like maybe Vidic didn't quite see him there uh, coming and, and didn't leave the room, or maybe he was still ahead. But either way, uh, they live to fight another day. For the lead, Gary Wimble has it. Luke McGrew wants it. Cattill passing Lawson Crane for third. Could the hybrid racing EG bounce back and steal a win here from the two Corvettes? McGrew looks to the left, but tucks now in behind Gary Wimble. He sees that white and green Civic coming. This is going to be an epic race to the end here. Gary Wimble has never won a Gridlife Touring Cup race for the seven, the trailing car. It's been over two years since he has tasted victory in this series, both of them. This would be a big day, Alex, if they could finish this one off. Yeah, I can't imagine either of these guys uh, want it any more or less than the other one. So it's just going to be an all-out fight to the end here. And for Eric Cattill, what a race it would be for him to rebound after winning the 2020 Gridlife Touring Cup Championship, and then battling for the 2021 championship, totaling a car at Road America, building an all-new one in the offseason, coming back, running in the top 10, the top 5, and now he's in the top 3, battling with Luke McGrew and Gary Wimble. Wimble slips, McGrew is right behind him, Wimble stays defensive, here comes Luke to the inside, not a gap there as they head into the carousel. Yep, and this is all going to benefit Eric Cattill. He's going to be watching this fight and, and licking his lips as he's ready to try and join them. Turn 19 coming up. Wimble stays track left to defend from Luke. Luke is so, so close. He sees the door open. He's got the seven car to the inside. Door still open now as they head to turn 20. Now he gets back in line behind the one. And this time, white flag is waving. Three and a half miles left here at Circuit of the Americas. Yeah, I'm right on cue. Eric has joined the fight here, and he's ready to, to take it to these guys too. Lawson Crane motoring up alongside Cattill as well. That could impact his ability to run down these two Corvettes. Certainly going to be frustrating for him to see those two vets drive away with the 137 up the inside. But Crane in his first GLTC weekend looking for a podium spot. And Tom O'Gorman is in the top five now after all of that. Past Michael Hilo and back into position to be top five here in this final race of the weekend. The triple seven in the background will curb hop there. And Crane and Cattill door to door into the S's. Cattill has to give it up. Crane now to P3. Yeah, and I think that little battle has kind of uh, taken them out of the fight for first, unfortunately, um, leaving Luke and uh, Wimble to go after it. The teammates will settle in amongst themselves. At least four now. It's still a long way around. Crane slipped big time there. Cattill's going to try the outside. A little bit of overlap he had, not quite. And now O'Gorman's in the mix here. So Cattill, in the area where his car is fastest, couldn't take advantage of it. And now O'Gorman has both those cars firmly in the windshield. Yeah, it really shows, doesn't it? Just one little mistake allowed uh, Tom O'Gorman to really join the party there in for third place. Joel Morrison to, on the inside of Ronnie Vidoc at turn number 11. And not quite past him, but he will get to him. There's Jeremy Swenson lurking, by the way, right behind Austin Hurdle. The last time up the long back straightaway here. And Gary Wimble has a five-car advantage over Luke McGrew. Luke's a little bit better in that stadium section. We'll see if he can get it done. Ulrich, Tyler Starr, Wesley Case, and the 23 of Brian Tyson all still fighting deeper in the field. Here comes O'Gorman up the outside of Cattill for fourth place. He's got the advantage here, but now it's inside for Cattill. The leaders only a half a car length between them. Turn 13. The seven sweeps to the outside. He's going to try to cross Gary over. There it is to the inside at turn 13. Here comes the seven to the inside. Got the nose ahead. Wimble trying to cling to it now as they hit 14 and 15. On the outside is Luke. Wimble defending tight. And he's still got it. We're still door to door. McGrew gets back on the power, shifts up a gear. Luke McGrew has the lead once more.
Yeah, and I wonder how that's going to play with the new directives there. Luke was off track when he went by, but did he gain an advantage from going off track, or did he just have to respond to Wimble? We'll find out in the post-race, but in the race right now, Cotill and O'Gorman door-to-door -door one more time here through turn 19. Tomo on the outside, Cotill on the inside. Checkered flag is going to wave this time by, and for the first time in 854 days, Luke McGrew and the number seven go to victory lane at Circuit of the Americas. Wimble, Crane, O'Gorman, and Cotill, the rest of the top five, Michael Hilo, Morrison, Vidoc, Swenson, Matt Walbaum, and Austin Hurdle, the rest of the top 11. Then Paul Curley from a long ways back up, 14 positions to 12th, Hans Horpital, Jensen, actually both Jensen's 14th and 15th, followed by McGinnis, uh, and looks like uh, Lavoie, Crispin, Chin, and Moore. Wow. Great race, wasn't it? That was <laughs> a great race. race. Man, the restarts just queue up such an epic battle for the front. And Luke McGrew, it has been such a long time. Last year, he didn't make it to race four. He had a, a Duratec swap, uh, NC generation Mazda Miata. Was getting pulled away on the straights. He just loaded his car up after race number two and drove home and said, I'm going to take a different approach. And went home, sold that car, bought this one, built it in half a season, came on back, and here he is back in victory lane. So he just said, you know what? We're going to try a different strategy. That strategy has worked. Yeah, it has, and you have to feel for Wimble. I mean, he did a lot of work to build that lead early in the race and had that taken away through the, the full-course yellow. Um, so, And that was really through no fault of his own, but that's racing, you know. It put, put Luke in the position to take that opportunity, and that's what he did. It was an exceptional drive by Gary Wimble, and, and honestly, you can't, what do you do if you're Wimble? If you didn't defend that, Luke would have gone up the inside at 13, but he had to defend it, and when he did, Luke just race crafted him from outside to the inside to call that the elevator move top to bottom and swung underneath him got the pass done and for the first time in a long time luke mcgrew is going to get one of those teal winner stickers to put on the a pillar yes yeah.